Fire Emblem Echoes Shadows of Valentia is a game where you can never deal zero damage. You always deal at least one damage, no matter how high the enemy's defense is. And it got me thinking, is the game actually possible to beat if all of my attacks dealt the minimum damage of one? So I modified the game to increase every enemy's defense and resistance to 99, effectively making all attacks except crits deal one damage. And when I say every enemy, I am also including every enemy summoned by Cantors, making Cantors extremely difficult to take down. So when I booted up my game, I knew this challenge oh no. would be a test of my patience. Oh no. I would need to use even the most obscure of combat arts and weapons to win, and I knew that this was a video that will make you like and subscribe. So for the first map, it's pretty easy to win. I just placed Mycin on the grave to increase his avoid, and the enemies could barely touch him. He doubled too, and that was extremely important for this run, as it effectively doubled the damage he dealt. While Mycin slowly chipped down his enemies, I realized that since the enemies are surviving much longer, they're going to attack me significantly more. So defense and avoid were going to be extremely important in this run, which fortunately Mycin had, and he proceeded to easily kill everyone on the map. Then after a few cutscenes, we proceeded on to Ram Village. There wasn't really much to do here, I just talked to some guys, then left the village and encountered Arm's first battle. Immediately from the start, I realized that the usual strategy of sending up Arm and Lucas to the forests to fight the brigands wouldn't work. They would likely just die before defeating them, so I needed healing. Fortunately, this problem could be solved with the supply tile near the top left side of the map, as it healed units for 5 HP a turn. So I retreated everyone into this choke point, and frontlined with Arm. The enemies dealt 2 damage to him, and he dealt 2 damage back. Back, but he could also land a crit to deal slightly more damage every now and again. I now pretty much just clicked end turn to slowly whittle down the bandits, and when Arm got low, I moved him onto the supply tile to heal him 5 HP a turn, while I swapped him out for Cliff to let him gain some EXP. And if I wanted a more durable option, I could also bring in Lucas, who like Arm took 2 damage and doubled. Considering I was dealing quite low damage, it was honestly quite easy to feed some kills to my weaker villagers, and eventually I managed to kill all the enemies, and moved on to a much harder map. Now, why was it much harder? Well, it's because of the archer. Not only do they have more attack than the brigands, but their attack range was extremely problematic. For one, it made it so I couldn't attack them on enemy phase, and if I attacked them on player phase, their high attack range allowed them to almost always position themselves in a forest, making actually landing my attacks extremely difficult. But what was the main problem is their high attack range allowed them to attack my fairly weak villagers who started towards the right side of the map like Bay, so I had to carefully use Arm and Lucas to hold them off, giving a small opportunity for my four villagers to retreat, and with his job done, Lucas could also retreat. Ray now ran over to the supply tile to both help him with healing and to deny the enemy's heal AI, as if any enemy's HP is reduced below 50%, they will run straight for a source of healing and will no longer attack. The four other members of my team ran to this area just south of Grey, so they would benefit from the forest tile's avoid boost, and their enemy enemies would not benefit from this boost. Meanwhile, Arm was fine fighting the enemies around him, and with his access to the convoy to pick up some provisions to heal, there wasn't really a chance he would die. After the brigands were slowly taken down, I lured the archer up close and surrounded them, making them easy to finally finish off. With just the boss remaining, I moved in Arm to fight them, then moved around them to claim the supply tile, and with its healing, I found it pretty easy to beat them. So now I could move on to the Thieves' Shrine our first dungeon. Immediately I picked up the iron sword that in this run isn't really useful, and I ended up just selling it. I now got ambushed by a brigand, oh no. and during this battle I realized that these battles are really not worth doing. They give like no EXP and take way too long to beat. Fortunately on turn 3 you can just retreat, ending the battle, making it quite convenient to avoid a long battle. Also for some reason on the emulator, if you run these just randomly show up, which was kind of weird. After reaching the end of the cave we encountered the mighty brigand boss. This is the rare defeat boss map, so my priority was taking him down, so I moved up both Arm and Lucas to have them fight the boss, and a few surrounding enemies. Unfortunately two enemies to the left moved move down, so I had to intercept with Cliff and Grey. Fortunately, they could stall them for quite a few turns, but Arm and Lucas were taking heavy damage each turn. I had to heal with provisions just to survive, but my resources eventually began to run out. I only had one piece of bread remaining. Fortunately, the boss's HP was low too, and eventually I saw an opportunity, so I moved up Faye to clear a path for Lucas to attack. 
bottom of a crit, we ended the map. After recruiting Silk and picking up the Miller's Turnwheel, it was time to promote my team. First up was Grey, who I made into a mercenary to give him some speed. Next up was Tobin, who I made into a mage, since he would pick up Excalibur very early, and crits are very good for this run. Additionally, he would eventually obtain Physic for a ranged heal, which I anticipated would be very useful. For Cliff, I made him into an archer. As with his high speed and defense growths, I expected him to grow into a unit that could tank almost everything and counterattack to eventually kill them. Finally, I promoted Faye into Cleric, as she got some strong spells early on with Physic at level 6 and Rescue at level 10. After reclassing everyone, I had 3 points of speed to distribute with the nearby spring. For now, I just gave 1 point of speed to Cliff and saved the other 2 points for later, meaning now I could move on to Storming of Ram Valley. This map features more annoying archers, along with a supplies tile far away from my initial position. At first, I just sent Arm and Lucas to hold off the incoming brigands, but since one of the archers was going to move around the mountain to attack my more fragile units, I had to move Cliff on the mountain tile to block them. Now, while Arm, Lucas, and Cliff were doing a great job at holding off the enemies to the right, since I wasn't blocking the supply tile, any enemies who had low HP just retreated, making it almost impossible to kill the enemies. Also, Grey wasn't doing too well fighting the powerful mercenary, so I decided to reset, and this time I lured in the enemies to the left with Lucas and retreated everyone else north. They just barely made it past the mercenary, moved through this choke point, and they reached the supply tile, allowing me to block it to prevent the enemies from retreating. Fortunately, the process of moving everyone around the map caused one of the archers to be completely split up from the huge blob of foes that were fighting Arm and Lucas, making them easy to kill. As for the other archer, I just lured them in front of Grey by positioning the fragile silk in range of them. With Faye's heals, she was able to survive long enough for them to die, and with my two healers healing, the remaining brigands were simple to deal with, ending the map. On the southern outpost, I moved my team up on turn 1, lured in a few enemies, then mated 2 to move south and 2 to fight Lucas. Lucas, who with our newly obtained Lever Shield took minimal damage. For the two in the south, their attack was fairly mediocre, and by attacking with our ranged units to avoid counterattacks, I had an easy time taking them down. So next up were the two near Lucas. With just two enemies, their damage was unimpressive, making killing them easy. Now I split my team up, with Cliff and Tobin leading an assault on the central part of the map, Ray making his way around the left side of the map to be located on the supply tile, and Arm and Lucas moved up the right side to surround the archer. With them eventually killed, I could move on to the boss, who wasn't that much stronger than the other enemies, I just surrounded him. I attacked him from range, and with Silk's healing, I had no problem surviving his attacks. Also, for this run, since speed and defense levels were very important, if I got to the end of a chapter and I got a bad level up, I would use Miller's Turnwheel to prevent the level up, and on the next map, I could level up again and hopefully get a better one. Anyway, with the boss now gone, I ran back to the spring and gave Cliff and Arm a point of speed. Then I explored the outpost, picked up a somewhat useful lightning sword with its 1-2 to two range, and I recruited Claire. I now journeyed over to Southern Sophia 1. These map names are great, I guess. Anyway, initially this map seemed a little tough, as there were a large amount of enemies guarding the supply tile, and they all charged in at once. I tried to move in with Arm and Lucas, but there were just too many enemies there. I couldn't reach the supply tile. Since I didn't want to get surrounded, I just tried retreating, but with the enemy Cavs' high move, they caught up, and eventually, both Arm and Lucas were surrounded. They were slowly dying, along with the rest of my team, who were pressured all the way back to the bottom right. Now, it seemed impossible to win, so I had to reset. On attempt 2, I had a better plan, as this time, instead of fighting the enemies near the supply tile, I ran left with everyone, except Claire, who stayed behind to lure the soldiers down a little, and with her high move, I was confident she could escape if they got close. Once enough enemies moved down, I moved Arm and Lucas up, with their goal to reach the supply tile to prevent the enemies from healing. Unfortunately, it left my less capable units alone, and they had to fight both the Cavs and some of the incoming soldiers, and Silk would die if two enemies attacked her at once, so I had to position exceptionally carefully, keeping most of my units close together to prevent them from being attacked by multiple enemies at once, and they slowly made their way up north. Fortunately, on the other side of the map, Arm and Lucas reached the supplies tile, and now they had a steady supply of healing, meaning they were extremely unlikely to die. When my other squad reached the top left, they were pretty much safe too, as they could position like this, both keeping Silk out of harm's way, and making it so only two enemies could attack the same unit at a time. With my clerics to patch up anyone who was low, they managed to hold out until the enemies began to die, allowing us to clear the map and move on 
on to Southern Zofia 2. A pretty easy chapter, as if I moved arm up to block the bridge above, the rest of my team only had to fight 4 calves, and by grouping together they were no problem. I could just heal any damage they dealt, and they eventually all met their demise. As for the other enemy squad, I first had to block the two supply tiles to prevent them from retreating. Claire could easily block one, and with Silk's Warp, Tobin could block the other. But since I actually wanted them to gain some EXP, I intentionally moved off the supply tile to lure in the calves, and with the healing from the supply tile, as well as the physic from Faye, they could easily finish off the final two calves and allow us to move on to the Deliverance's hideout. Anyway, like before, for battles in here, I just retreated to save me some time. And the only important item here is the Iron Bow, having one more attack range over just the regular bow. Once I reached the end, I obviously recruited Clive and Forsyth, then reached the spring and gave two points of defense to Arm and one point of defense to Cliff. After recruiting Python on the way out, I journeyed over to the Zofia Gate. Immediately from the start, I wanted to kill the archers at this part over here, so I warped Arm and Lucas over to fight them. I also warped Cliff over towards the left to dispatch the two archers over there. Once all the archers died, it was time to move up and bait in Slade's squad. Now Arm and Lucas just retreated and three calves chased after them, and the other four calves moved towards my other team. I held off the calves in the front with Grey and Claire, and dealt some extra damage with ranged attacks from Cliff, Tobin and Python. To prevent the calves from retreating, I walked in Clive to block the choke point from the other side, and now they could steadily kill the incoming foes. So my focus now shifted to Arm and Lucas, who ran all the way around the map, with their goal being to meet up with my of a team, but while I was doing this, I noticed the enemies were choosing to fight Lucas rather than Arm, so I decided to move Arm up to block the choke point above, trapping two of the three calves. Unfortunately, one of the calves slipped by before Arm got into position, so I had to warp up Forsyth to deal with them. Now once all the calves except Slade died, I moved Arm out of the way to allow Slade to retreat to heal, as killing him would make it impossible to kill Desai, who I wanted to kill to pick up the very useful Draco shield. So I moved closer towards Desai to bait out more enemies, who again I lured into this choke point and blocked them off to prevent them from retreating. While this happened, I lured in a mage and killed them to prevent another source of healing. After baiting out the final two archers and killing them, just slayed to say and a knight remained. So I moved up to bait in to say with arm, and I then warped arm to the other side to block to say's path to healing. And with constant attacks from my ranged units, to say eventually died, leaving just one enemy left. Who, after we killed, we beat the chapter. After going back to the nearby Miller statue to promote Cliff, I entered Zofia Castle and chose to not pick up the Iron Shield as I wanted Celica to pick it up later. With that done, I moved on to Celica's route and it started with a speed spring, and I decided to give one point of speed to Bowie and two points of speed to Selica. Then I moved on to the Nova's Graveyard, and this map was actually looking fairly difficult, but it wasn't really to do with the enemies we were facing, and more to do with the fact that two of our allies are mages, meaning they would consume an extra two HP with every combat since they doubled. This would significantly decrease their durability, meaning for this map, I had to primarily rely on Selica and Jenny, and Jenny was actually surprisingly my best option to fight most of the terrors, as they dealt about 4 damage to her at about a 25% chance to hit if she was on a grave. So when surrounded, she would on average get hit once for 4 HP, and with Nosferatu, she could attack 8 times at a 60% chance to hit. So she should at least heal around 4 HP a turn, meaning she was technically invincible, but my other units weren't as durable. And since in some Fire Emblem games, the enemy AI would just group around Jenny, I didn't expect them to actually move towards Celica, who was positioned a little too close to Mei and Bowie, causing a terror to attack Bowie. Since this was a losing battle, I used the turn wheel to rewind, and now Celica moved up a little more, and she had an easy time fighting off the three terrors on a grave tile. One terror made it past both Jenny and Celica, and while Bowie and Mei were more fragile, with their items for healing to keep Bowie healthy, they managed to take them down, and the other terrors were no problem for Celica and Jenny. So I cleared the map and progressed to the Novus Great Pods. There wasn't really much to do here, I just recruited Saber and moved on to Zofia Seaway 1. This map is mostly easy, there's a few mediocre brigands, and while there was a supply tile in range for the brigands to retreat to, since there was such a large number of brigands, they were actually blocking their path to retreat. So if I got one low, they would just stop attacking, 
and would just stay there until they died. However, after I killed enough of them, there was finally space to retreat. But if one was standing on the supply tile, the other brigands would no longer run away. So I had a few turns to kill a brigand while one was healing. And with everyone attacking at once, this wasn't actually that hard. Eventually they were down to three final brigands, and two were retreating. So I chased after one and killed one, leaving just the boss and another one who was healing alive. And when I weakened the boss low enough for them to try to heal, I just chased them to the heal tile and swiftly killed them. With the final brigand alone, they were fairly simple to kill. Zofia Seaway 2 is similar to Zofia Seaway 1, just much bigger. There are two entrances to the opposing boat as well as more supply tiles. To start the map off, I used Jenny's Invoke Soldiers to hold off most enemies and lured them near the right side of the map, giving me an opportunity to trap one of the brigands who moved in from the left and then kill them, allowing Selica to move up towards a supply tile and fight another brigand that I lured down with Bowie and swiftly dispatched, permitting the rest of my team to move up, allowing me to secure two supply tiles. Now with the help of Jenny's invoked soldiers, I could drive the enemies back, allowing Selica to stand on the third supply tile. With those tiles blocked, Jenny's invoked soldiers could help me power through the remaining enemies allowing me to both trap and kill them, making it quite easy to finish the map. The Pirate's Throne was the next map, and it was a map that seemed almost impossible to keep Valbar, Kamui, and Leon alive. They just didn't have the durability to survive when continuously attacked, and the continuous damage they would take every turn would eventually result in their demise. But you see, there actually was a way I could keep them all alive. You see, if you retreat, you don't suffer any real downsides. And if I got lucky enough to kill an enemy before any of Valbar's squad died, I could retreat, and when I came back to the map, the unit I killed would be gone. So basically, if I kept entering the map, killing an enemy, and retreating before Valbar, Leon, or Kamui died, I could gradually kill the enemies, eventually resulting in a mostly clear path towards Valbar's squad, as long as I used the Invoke Soldiers to keep a few enemies away, making it easy to heal and assist them. And after dealing with a few brigands, I moved to engage the boss at Bath. While his stats were a little higher than the other brigands, and he was located on a supply tile, by just weakening him to make him retreat, then by using a frail unit to make him move off the tile, I could take the tile, and with no way to heal, Bath was eventually dispatched by Bowie. Then, after recruiting Valbar, Leon, and Kamui, I progressed onto a map that, at first, I wasn't sure was possible. In this map, you face a single canter, and what's noteworthy about canters is they obviously summon terrors which is a huge problem, as it makes reaching him really hard, as the terrors he summons had 41 HP. I had to land 41 attacks to kill just one terror that he was constantly summoning. This made it extremely hard to reach him, but if I killed a terror on player phase, I could move forward one space and eventually reach him. Right now, Selica could attack him, but her alone wasn't enough, as with the supply tile he was standing on, combined with the incarnation skill, he healed 10 HP a turn. So if I wanted to even harm him, I had to deal at least 11 damage on one turn. I needed multiple units in range to attack him. So I reset, and on my next try, I was lucky enough to get a few units in range to attack him. And now I had a new problem that even if I dealt over 11 damage in a single turn, the Kanda would attack me back. And as I constantly lost HP, I could no longer safely attack him, and he would slowly start to regen HP again. So I needed more healing to fight the Kanda. And my solution to that was to grind up Selica to level 9 to pick up Recover. But that alone wasn't enough, so I grinded Jenny to level 12 to pick up Expel, which should grant a means to quickly dispatch of huge waves of terrors summoned by the canter. Unfortunately, it didn't end up working very well, as despite a supposedly 65% chance to hit, it really rarely kills anyone, and with its high HP cost, it wasn't really worth using. Jenny needed more HP to get better value out of it. And how would I do that? I just needed to promote her to boost her HP to 30, more than enough to cast Expel twice in a row without any help. So I did some grinding and ran back to the Priory to give Jenny some extra stats and the surprisingly effective skill Soothing Light. Pretty useful if Jenny was busy using Expel. Okay, so I made my way back to the Cancer and Expel was certainly useful in clearing a way forward. But as I tried to attack him, it became clear that his healing was way too much. Right now, without multiple lucky crits in a row, there seemed to be no way to kill them. But then I looked at the map 
and I saw a solution. Jenny's invoked soldiers. You see, if they attacked into the boss, they would be doubled and one rounded, consuming two HP from the boss since they used magic. And since every turn Jenny could summon at least four of them, I could constantly deal eight damage with these green units. And also these green units could deal damage if they actually hit the boss. And at around a 50% chance to hit between four of them, this would result in about two damage on average. And if we combine this with the self damage from the boss's magic, we would deal 10 damage a turn with Jenny, effectively nullifying the boss's healing. Meaning with this plan, I could actually kill her. I had some problems getting into the perfect position to execute this plan, as if a terror was in range of one of the green units, they would prefer to attack them rather than the boss, since the boss obviously killed them. Because of this, I had a little trouble getting into position. And the main reason for this is I just kept using a spell, as I thought it would clear me a path forward, but this was actually a mistake, as the unit limit for enemies is 20. So this kinda could only summon 19 revenants at a time, and if enough were behind me, I could push forward to the boss's position and surround them, which I needed to do to prevent any terrors from moving through the canter. When my setup was complete, my strategy worked like a charm, and with some funders from my mages along with Leon's arrows, I eventually conquered the close to impossible map in just around 5 hours of my real life time. Nothing too bad, and I did also find out that in this game, if enough turns pass, the turn wheel just like stops working, which is worth noting for future maps. Now I sailed my way west to the Seabound Shrine, that was guarded by two Necro Dragons. Fortunately, with the help of Jenny's soldiers to deal some chip damage, the first wasn't really a problem, but the second, however, held a blessed ring, healing 5 HP a turn, meaning it was going to need a little more firepower to take down, which came in the form of just placing all my ranged units in range to attack, and from there, it didn't take too long to deal the finishing blow, meaning we could now enter the Seabound Shrine's dungeon. This place features no required battles, so it was pretty easy. While I was here, I did make sure to pick up 4 coral fragments to complete a side quest later on. Then at the Miller Shrine, I promoted a few units. Once that was done, I came across two springs. I had the choice of either skill or HP. Since they were fairly mediocre stats, I didn't put too much thought in giving Leon one point of skill and HP, and giving Jenny one extra HP. After journeying deeper into the shrine, and retreating from a big battle, I reached yet another spring. This one gave resistance. I gave the res to Celica and Mei, since they already had decent res. Then after picking up the Blessed Sword, I left the shrine leaving the EXP spring untouched, as I wanted to save it for the end of the act. Now I move north, to a map very similar to Sophia Seaway 1, so I used a similar strategy as I did that time of luring the enemies in, then attack them with everyone at once, and since some enemies blocked their path to retreat, they couldn't go back to heal, making most of the brigands easy to take down, and I even managed to lure in a archer up close, making them easy to beat. Honestly, the rest of this map is fairly unnoteworthy, so let's move on to the next map. A much harder map, as the enemies were entirely comprised of mages, who had recover so they could heal each other if they got low. So I needed to split them up, and I did this by placing Jenny right over here to the left, and with her high res and a blessed ring equipped, there was no chance she would die, allowing me to slowly bait in the enemies to the right. Unfortunately, by mistake, two of them grouped together, but fortunately, they didn't heal each other, and it seemed quite random when they would actually heal, but it was good for me as I managed to dispatch them with ease, and I now baited out a few more from the left who were also quite simple to beat. To help take out a few more, I summoned a few soldiers, and by focusing one at a time, the final three were easy to take down, because fortunately, they weren't healing each other, which I think is just good RNG as they did heal each other later on. With the penultimate battle of Act 2 complete, I quickly ran back to the deepest part of the Seabound Shrine, and used the two uses of the EXP Spring on Bowie, allowing me to promote him. Back at Sophia Harbor, I completed this side quest where you have to trade in at five Coral Fragments with four being from the Seabound Shrine and one from Sophia Harbour. At Sophia Castle, Celica was ambushed by a canter. Initially, I was quite scared here, as if that canter could summon terrors, this map would be a nightmare. Fortunately, this one just doesn't summon anything, so I only had to fight some mediocre mages, who with everyone attacking at once were easy to finish off, and eventually just leaving the canter. While his incarnation's healing was a little annoying to beat, I could overcome it since he was a mage, and he would deal damage to himself with every time he attacked me. 
And another reason this guy was much easier than the other canter is he actually attacks you so you can deal damage on enemy phase. Once they finally died, I was free to explore Sophia Castle, which meant I could pick up the iron shield I intentionally didn't pick up with arm, as I anticipated that Selica's route in Act 3 and 4 would be significantly harder than arm's route. After Selica met back up with arm, we proceeded on to Act 3. I decided to start with arm's route, as if I progressed far enough, I could use the traveling merchant to send the Draco shield over to Selica to help her out. Anyway, for the first map, Northern Sophia, I gave the Draco shield over to Cliff and walked him up to hold off a majority of the incoming enemies, since he took like no damage from every enemy there. However, there were a few witches on this map who warped in to pressure my team. Fortunately, by surrounding them and continuously attacking them, I made short work of both of them, meaning I could move arm left to intercept the rapidly approaching Cavs and Fernand. With arm's good defense and phase healing with physic, both arm and Cliff had no chance of dying, meaning almost every enemy would slowly kill themselves on enemy phase now. Except one, a strong armored knight, who I lured into the bottom right side of the map and attacked them with most of my ranged units, easily dropping their HP below 50%, causing them to retreat to the supply tile in the top left and top right side of the map. So after chasing them down and killing them, I used warp descending gray and moved in Claire to block these two tiles to prevent anyone from retreating. With both Arm and Cliff almost invincible with phase physics, the rest of the map was pretty simple. To speed things up, I ended up luring some enemies down so I could attack them with more units in a single turn. But there really were no surprises from this point. Every enemy just slowly but surely died and I eventually moved on to this map with the mages. I actually forgot to record the first few turns for this one, but with the power of Miller's turn wheel you can sort of see what happened. So at the start of the map, I warped Cliff up, who held the Draco shield to fight the mages above, and with Silk's high res, she could easily fight the mages in the south, while the rest of my team just ran away towards the left. Cliff now made his way around the top of the map, positioned on the supply tile for some extra healing. I now lured in one mage at a time over towards the left, and attacked with my whole team to swiftly take down the mages one at a time. After repeating this strat a few times, I cleared out all the mages in the south, and I then started to move towards the north to do the same to the mages near Cliff. Once they all died, I could journey west to begin our first battle against Burkut. Honestly, another pretty easy one. First off, there are only three enemies, and Cliff with the Draco Shield took only one damage from all of them, meaning with the Draco Shield's healing, there was no chance he would die. But if I just used Cliff, the map would be a little slow. So like in the previous map, I lured over one of the enemies, in this case the generic Paladin, then I surrounded him to stop him from moving and continuously attacked from at a distance and up close. Once they were dispatched, I pretty much did the same to Fernand. And when he was finished off, I moved on to Bakut, who was a little harder with his healing, but still, it was a quite easy battle to win. I now entered the forest village to recruit Lufia, send the Draco Shield over to Selica, and to forge up her Steel Shield. After I left the village, a paladin from the Say moved over, so I had to fight them. Since this was a generic fight, I'm not going to waste your time explaining what happened. Just know that Cliff is pretty strong and the enemies are pretty weak. So then I could march over to the Say, who had some calves as backup, increasing the amount of units on the map to 20, meaning the counter located in the top right of the fort would right now not use Conjure. Anyway, I immediately begun this map by warping in Cliff, and as long as he was on a supply tile, his high defense would allow him to take every unit that attacked him. Arm now blocked the choke point into the Say's fort, and Claire moved towards the right to attack the witch, who ended up teleporting over to the left where most of my team could just attack her. Now Claire moved up a little, in anticipation of the mage using Fortify, which dropped their HP down to 2, making it possible for Claire to kill them and be safely rescued out by Faye. Then with one of the enemy sources of healing gone, I could begin the tedious task of taking out the archers, who were Matilda's biggest threat as they continuously attacked her. Some of the archers were as simple as just luring them next to arm for him to kill, while their path to retreat was blocked by another enemy, as there was still one supply tile unoccupied as one was taken by Cliff and another by the Say. The other supply tile was usually already blocked by a knight or a cav, who were low on HP by attacks from Cliff or arm meaning the archers weren't really benefiting from the heal tile, allowing me to kill them until just two remained. And for those two, I walked up arm to block the final supply tile. So the 
archers could no longer heal, meaning Cliff's attacks would eventually result in the archers dying. From here, I just prioritized attacking the enemies that were not the Sei, the Kanta, or the Terrors. And when they were all killed, I could shift my focus to actually killing the Kanta. Reaching them from the main entrance seemed difficult, so I just retreated to Law in the Terrors, and my plan was to move all the way around the map so I could warp over the wall and begin to attack them. Also, to make sure Matilda didn't die, I ended up rescuing her out. Once a few units warped over, I began to attack the Kanta with Arm, Cliff, and Claire. I kept them all healed with Phase Physics, Cliff's Blustering, and any emergency heals could be sold by the provisions in the convoy. With Claire's high crit rates from Arm Support, it didn't take too long to finish off the Kanta, leaving just to say alive, who was nothing special. It didn't take too long to kill him, meaning we could now explore the inside of the Say's Fortress. It held a few useful items like the Royal Sword to grant Arm Recovery, a Cog for more turn wheel uses, an Exotic Spice to grant us free gold marks for forging, a Pegasus Cheese that grants 2 speed, a Coral Ring for some additional res, and even Matilda who was pretty useful with her high res and speed. Unfortunately, after exiting the Say's Fortress, I encountered some mages, but by positioning like this to swiftly take them down, I had no problems for the first few, since their path to retreat to the supply tiles was blocked, and when enough were killed, I just walked Matilda behind them to block them from retreating, making the remaining mages easy to kill, meaning we could advance north to this map with a huge amount of caps, 10 on the right and 10 on the left. For the left side, I sent in Arm and Cliff, as if they were split up, they could stall 8 calves and get surrounded. For the 8 that they were fighting, they could sustain themselves with the 5 HP healing from Arm's Sword and Cliff's Coral Ring. And on the left, Silk and Faye were fine to fight 6 calves if they stood next to each other. And since they were next to each other, they could just heal each other if one was on low HP. I also placed Matilda nearby with her goal being to bait some of the calves to chase after her as she and Clive moved towards the supply tower where they should have an easy time fighting. One of the calves to the left moved down and I had to quickly deal with them, as the powerful boss was pincering me from the other side. Since my weaker units weren't well equipped to deal with this, I distracted another cav approaching from the right by placing Clive here. My southern team still had to deal with the boss, but by positioning Bray and Claire here, the boss would exclusively attack Claire. And with the help of Physic from Faye, it was unlikely she would die. Once the enemy started to die, I had space to move with units like Arm and Cliff to assist units who were having a little trouble like Clive. Eventually, all the cabs died, allowing me to enter the Sylvan Shrine. Here, there wasn't too many useful items, only really a gold mark in the room with the gargoyles, along with a girl who you have to talk to to complete a quest. The biggest reward here was the Miller Shrine, as it allowed me to promote most of my team, with Clive needing three levels from a nearby spring to become a gold knight for a significant stat boost. On the way out, I visited another spring, this one boosted res, and I gave the two points to Cliff. After evacuating the dungeon, I advanced to the forest north side, a map with multiple archers that could all be blocked off by Cliff by just rescuing him up. With his high defense of 16, he took one damage from all of the enemies, meaning the only slightly difficult part about this map were the two witches. The first almost died on the first turn they teleported in, thanks to some lucky crits, and the second was equally pathetic. Since the archers Cliff was fighting would eventually retreat to the supply tiles, I decided to bait some of them south so I could surround them and kill them far away from the supply tile. After securing a few more kills, I decided it would be more efficient to just move Cliff onto a supply tile, so he could block them from healing, and I walked Python onto the other supply tile to prevent anyone from healing. Now it was just a matter of time before everything died, except the archers attacking Python, since he couldn't attack back, as he lacked the range without an iron bow equipped. Fortunately, with the help of Silk's summoned dreadfighters, they were easy to surround and even easier to finish off. So next was the final arm map for Act 3, Retaking of the Sluice Gate. This map was entirely comprised of mages. To start the map off, I moved Cliff up in an attempt to block off the choke towards the left, and I also moved up Silk with her high res to block the choke to the right, and together they stopped anyone from coming in from above. Unfortunately, on turn 2, I found out that the mages could move along the cliff tiles, so Cliff needed some backup to block the choke. I went for Claire since she had pretty good res and HP. Since the mages to the right would eventually heal, I warped in Python to allow him to stand on the supply tile. Delphia now warped in, and she was real easy to drop to 1 HP, since Aura, her only attacking spell, cost a large amount of HP of 6, and at 1 HP she could no longer attack or do anything, so I didn't have to worry about her anymore. 
and I then focused my efforts to the enemies to the left and to the north. Fortunately, I dealt with them with relative ease, but to the east it wasn't so easy, as the mages started to heal each other and group together, making it risky to keep Python on the supply tile, so I rescued him away, and after the mages healed a little, I walked in Cliff, who had much better res. With the mages split up, and Claire positioned to stop them from regrouping, they were easy to take down, and I started to advance north towards the final three mages. Since the first one was separated from the other two, they were no problem when lured out of range of the bosses fortify. With the final two, I knew I needed to split them up, so I placed Cliff right here to steadily bait one of the mages around, and with them out of range to heal the boss, I could actually begin to fight the boss, who with his death spell consuming 5 HP with every attack, was swiftly killed, and obviously cleaning up from here was easy meaning we could start Selica's route. This first map seemed a little chaotic, as I wanted both Katria and Paula to survive, and with every enemy being difficult to kill, it was easy for them both to be attacked across multiple turns in a row. Fortunately, by attacking one of the brigands, I weakened them low enough for them to run away. That conveniently caused Paula and Katria to chase after them, placing them far away from a majority of the enemies. That were now fighting Kamui, Jenny, and Jenny's invoked soldiers. Towards the left, I was having a pretty easy time just dispatching most enemies with Saber. Also to the right, Katria actually walled off this brigand. So after killing this guy with 1 HP, Valbar now blocked the supply tile. And with no access to healing, most enemies gradually started to die, and were not threatening to me since I had an abundant amount of options to heal. With Selica and Bowie's recover, Saber's Bless Sword for 5 HP a turn, and the especially effective Physic on Jenny. After the opposing army fell, I ventured north to a graveyard, home to some revenants who dealt extremely poor damage in combat, but the 10 damage dealt from being poisoned was much more scary. They were still no problem, and with Jenny's expel, I could quickly dispatch them, allowing me to move on to the nearby village where I recruited Atlas, and forged a few weapons to gain some extra crit, since crits were a big damage boost. After exiting the village, I had to pass by the cemetery again. This time it was home to Bonewalkers and Gargoyles, who were far easier than the Revenants, so they dealt like no damage and were simple to beat. The next map was the Desert Stronghold, a map that looked quite annoying with a large map out of both archers and supply tiles. First, I summoned an army of soldiers with Jenny, and approached the first formation of units. The most important foes to kill here were the mages, who for some reason didn't retreat to heal when they were below 50% of their max HP, making them vulnerable to die on the next turn. After surrounding the other mage, allowing for a quick kill, I could start to execute my plan, and this plan was to just give Leon the Draco shield, and I moved him up along with Jenny's soldiers to help him reach a desirable position. The position I wanted him to hold was at the entrance of the fort, to prevent any enemies who ran out of the fort from healing with the supply tiles inside of the fort. I couldn't reach this position at first, but by summoning in more of Jenny's soldiers, the enemies moved out of the way, and Leon blocked the entrance to the fort, and with the Draco shield equipped, he took a whopping 1 damage from every enemy that attacked him. With Jenny's physics to keep him sustained, it really now just took like 25 turns of ending turn to kill all enemies on the outside of the fort, excluding the snipers equipped with bows, who I then killed shortly after. To finish off the remaining enemies, I just lured them out of the fort and blocked their healing again. With many of my units attacking them at once, it didn't take too long for the final enemy to die, and I cleared the map. After exploring the inside of the fort to recruit Jesse and to pick up some items, I came in contact with another enemy encounter, one sent over from Grief. Since I held the inside of the fort, the enemies couldn't really heal, and with the Drake of Shield, I could literally just end turn for like 30 turns or so to kill all of them, but I wanted to distribute some of my EXP to Jesse to get him promoted to make him usable, and I wanted to level my Pegasus Knight since flyers are pretty good. When the map finally ended, I was given a choice to head north to kill Dean and later recruit Sonya, or head south to kill Sonya and recruit Dean. Dean's good stats made him a better choice of a Sonya as a unit, so you'd think I'd head south, but Sonya's map seemed hard, as it was filled with annoying witches who could teleport around. While Dean's map looked comparatively easy, as it contained some weak mercenaries and myrmidons who had low move in the desert, so I just decided to fight Dean, since his map seemed quite easy. So easy in fact that I literally just used like 3 units to win, with Paula with a Draco shield she was able to take on everyone near Dean, and Katria with an Iron Shield easily could fight off the mercenaries near her. With some physics for some extra sustain, there was no chance I would lose, but towards the end of the map I did move in Kamui to pick up some EXP, as I wanted to get him promoted into Dreadfighter before I started Act 4. Anyway, with this easy map conquered, I reached 
Reef Citadel. A map that not only looked very difficult to beat, but it would take a very long time to beat. There were many mages who could heal each other, multiple supply tiles, and what was worse of them all, a canter. Fortunately, initially Grief's army consists of 20 units, so at first that canter wouldn't summon anyone. But since there were multiple enemies that initially moved, with the witches being the most deadly, I had to kill some of them, and with them gone, the canter could start summoning. In an attempt to both prevent the enemies from healing, and to keep the bone walkers away, I flew Katria in to place her on the supply tile, and with the Draco Shield's immense defense boost, along of its 5 HP healing plus the 5 HP healing from the supply tile, she was now pretty much invincible. While she did this, I used the rest of my team to fight the sniper, however killing him seemed unlikely if they got healed or retreated, so I intentionally didn't block the supply tile near the bottom right side of the map, and when they were low they ran straight over there, in range to get destroyed by May. Now I immediately placed my attention to the units above, so I weakened with Leon and used Parla to finish them off. With a more durable sniper, I did have to go up far enough that Grief Squad started to move, but since they were stuck in a choke point, they weren't really all that challenging. As after I killed the sniper who actually ran down, I moved Parla down and around to trap them. With no access to healing, it was only a matter of time before they died. During the end of this tedious process, Enough enemies had died to the point that the summoned Bonewalkers had no space to attack Katria and were actually moving towards Selica. Right now it was just one at a time, but I knew I wanted to push towards the canter as fast as I could. But first I had to clear out any problems on the way. The first was the mage to the right of the canter. Ola didn't have a hard time dropping them to heal range but they sadly reached the supply tile, and considering Miller's turn wheel broke like a hundred turns ago, I didn't want to risk Parla's life on something that could be sold with a little patience, as eventually they ran along the left side here, easily in range for Bowie, Selica, and Leon to weaken, and Parla to finish off. Once I killed one final mage to the left, I hatched a plan of using Katria and Parla to lure in as many bone walkers as possible, as I could then block them off so there was a relatively clear path towards the canter. It didn't work exactly as planned, but it made it far easier to reach the Canter. I initially tried the same strategy as I did last time, of summoning soldiers to steadily kill him, but I found that with my team's significant increase in offensive power thanks to higher crit weapons, they were actually pretty easy to beat when up close, as I managed to defeat them in just two turns of me attacking them allowing me to clear the grueling 3 hour long map with Katria now at level 20 and Paula almost at level 20. Anyway, inside we recruited Est and Sonya, picked up a shield you need for a side quest, and I also talked to B-Mail, allowing us to proceed to Act 4 when we reached the Temple of Miller. On the way there, I engaged another fight in the cemetery. It was pretty much the same fight as the first time we were here, so it was pretty easy. The next map was another pretty simple one. I just gave Leon the Draco shield, moved him up into this area right here, he now stopped my foes from healing, and with his attack range, he could gradually kill them on enemy phase. There were three units that didn't fight him, with the two frail witches along with the pretty strong boss, who hit exceptionally hard, at pretty bad hit rates. The Selica didn't really get hit by them, and eventually killed them. While Leon was fine by himself, I would rather Est gain some EXP, so when the enemies were low enough, I moved her in to steal the kill, as I wanted to get her promoted by Act 4. Anyway, from this point onward, we had pretty much already won. I just had to hit the archer a couple times and the map was over. I now took a detour to the west to enter the Dragon Shrine, as I wanted to promote a few of my units, with Saber going into Dreadfighter, Jesse into Myrmidon, Leon into Bow Knight, and Katra into Falcon Knight. As for the dungeon itself, there's nothing too special in here, but what is worth mentioning is it is home to our first unretreatable dungeon battle against some necro dragons. To easily win this encounter, I merely positioned in sort of a line, making it possible for the necro dragons to only attack one of my fragile units at a time. Anyone who was injured was quickly healed by Silica, and in like 10 turns, I killed them all, rewarding me with a very useful coral ring, an extra use of Miller's turn wheel, along with a resurrection shrine, useful for reviving my whopping zero dead characters. On my way out, I promoted Mei and Parla, and was ambushed by a fight with a massive army of three whole paladins who are about as hard as clicking the like and subscribe button, which is easy so you should do it. With that map done, I was ready to head over to the final required Act 3 map that looked pretty hard since we had to fight a canter. Anyway, I started my first turn off by just moving everyone up as I wanted to kill the canter quickly. After the boss conjured some gargoyles, Katria moved just left of the boss in this choke point here to hold off everyone in that direction. 
Once I opened the door with Paula, I knew exactly what I needed to do to kill the Cantor. First, I had to lure the mage and sniper south, and then surround and kill them. I did this first to the sniper, and then to the heart hitting mage. With Genetic spells to make it past the gargoyles, I moved most of my team near the canter and they all began to attack. But since he was equipped with Maya that had a high might of 10, he was hitting back for high damage, limiting the units that could attack him, as Mei, Sonya, and Paula couldn't survive taking another hit. Even unlucky crits were a problem for some units, so I needed to use the turn wheel. What also was annoying is allies that were hit by the boss were liable to die to a hit or two from the summoned gargoyles. The only unit that had a good matchup against the boss was Saber, who as a dread fighter could easily shrug off their powerful attacks. With Selica who was constantly healed to land crits on him, it fortunately didn't take too long to take this guy out. With the gargoyles gone, the ranged units attacking Katria were more manageable, and I pretty much lured them down in position to be surrounded then killed or just killed. Once the final helpless mage met their end, I entered the Temple of Miller and Selica promoted, allowing her to talk to this NPC and end her route for Act 3. But first, I wanted both the level 7 Kamui to reach level 10 to promote, and I also wanted the level 10 S to reach level 12 to promote. With the nearby EXP spring, it luckily didn't result in me having to do too much grinding, especially considering I planned to head back to the mountain village to give the Ryan Shield to Arm, to complete a quest for an extra Pegasus cheese. I also did some forging, for Leon I was considering making a kill bow for better offense, but I decided that a regular silver bow had the potential to also be very good, since its combat art ward arrow that silenced would probably be great against canters. I also forged an ill wound from an upgraded shadow sword. The sword has decent crit and low hit. The reason I forged it is for its second combat art, lunge, allowing a sword user to swap places with an enemy. Again, pretty useful against canters who situate themselves on supply tiles for healing. On my way back to the Miller Temple, I considered trading this shield for a golden apple, but since the shield increased res, I decided to just keep the shield. Once I made it back to the temple, everyone I cared about promoted, and now I had a few side quests to do with Arm. First, I recruited Delphia, then I ran back to the forest village, and since I rescued this girl, she has a quest for me to give her cute items. The reward you get from this is random, but I wanted the cog for an extra use of Miller's turn wheel. Since I only had one cute item with a black pearl, I had to reset to obtain the cog that I picked up on on just my second try. Back at Sophia Castle, I traded in the shield from Selica for the cheese and talked to this NPC to unlock a quest in the Deliverance's hideout, where you fight this really strong entombed with 27 attack and 16 speed. With their low HP, they were pretty much a glass cannon, but Arm, Claire, and Cliff were more than up for the task of killing them, or weakening them really, as I warped Delphia in at the end to gain a level. With the armlet in our possession, I could go back to the NPC from before to finish this quest. But doing this actually unlocks another quest, where you have to go back to the same place as last time, but this time you fight a Guardian, who is not all that hard. But his friend, the Sage over there, hits really hard, so I just placed my overleveled Cliff in there with the backup of Silk Stratfighters. Since they were consuming 8 HP with Sajite, they couldn't really attack that much. Then with them eventually gone, the enemies could no longer deal much damage, so it was a free win from there. With a decent shield added to my inventory, I finally opened the sluice gate and ended Act 3. For Act 4, I decided to start with Selica's route, but first I ran back into Miller's Temple to check out the newly unlocked areas containing a mage ring, two points of attack that I gave to Jenny, and Noma, a guy who can heal us. Once I left the temple, I immediately ran north to Dead Man's Mire, the first Selica map of Act 4, and it already set the standard for most Act 4 Selica maps of being extremely annoying, as it features not one canter, not two canters, but three of them. Additionally, there was a huge poisonous swamp that's slowing my advance towards them, so my best units on this map were going to be my flyers, who could move about and not care about the harsh terrain. They immediately charged towards the two canters in the top left. There's some and terrors unfortunately got in the way, but since the Bone Walker's move was restricted by the swamp, they managed to move by them, kill this mage, and reach the boss, a canter who summoned mobile gargoyles, and had the powerful magic Maya. To minimize the damage they dealt, I traded around the Draco shield making it so whoever attacked had a significant res boost. Thanks to Maya's 2 HP consumption per attack, the attacks of just Katria and Est were enough to outdamage their 5 HP healing, meaning eventually they died. Meanwhile, my other units baited in some foes across the poisonous swamp that dealt a respectable 5 damage a turn, and I lured them deeper into the swamp with Saber. Enemies who were bold enough to run out of the swamp were quickly surrounded and died shortly after. With good use of my Dreadfighters and Leon's high attack 
range, the mages were no more, and so was the sniper, leaving just two enemy counters remaining, along with whatever terrors they had summoned. The one in the south was dispatched in the same way as the first, Katria, Parla, and S just traded around the Draco shield amongst themselves, and whoever had the shield attacked, dealing three damage per action. So with two units attacking in a turn, the boss's HP would slowly run out. But that was a little slow, so I sent Saber across the swamp to help engage the final counter, who with my shield trading strategy was simple to beat. With everyone dead, I progressed north to encounter some Necro Dragons. For this map, I just decided to not deploy any especially frail units, and with everyone grouped together, the dragons were not really difficult, and they slowly died across like 11 turns. Once I cleared the map, it was time for another pretty annoying one, as this one featured a canter all the way in the back, and there were a few extra Necro Dragons present since the boss summoned them prior to me entering the map. Anyway, since canters like to move towards defensive terrain, I immediately equipped Katria with a Draco Shield, and she rushed south to block the lower right supply tile. And with the Draco Shield's defensive boosts, the other enemies nearby were no problem. While Katria did this, the rest of my team was pressured by a few Necro Dragons. The Dragons couldn't heal or deal much damage, so their deaths were inevitable. However, Est had to move south, as the enemy Kanto noticed a clear path towards the lower left supply tile, so I needed someone to block it. She couldn't make it there in time since I noticed her moving a little late, and I fixed this mistake with the turn wheel. Conveniently, when Est reached the supply tile, the rest of my team had just finished off the first few Necro Dragons, meaning Parla could come in and try to assist Est. She did this by making some of the summoned Necro Dragons move up in range to be expelled away, making the Kanto move right next to Est, and with their only attacking spell being death, consuming 5 HP a turn, I thought maybe S could take out the cancer by herself. Unfortunately, this didn't work as planned, thanks to the other mages equipped with Recover, as the cancer ran over to them for some heals. So S and Parla had to chase them down to prevent them from healing by the mages. But in doing so, S moved off the supply tile, so now they were headed over there, and they'd reach the tile on the next turn. And with dragons blocking the way to place my flyer on there again, I had to kill the boss on this turn. At first, I traded the Draco shield over to Parla, causing her to get doubled, causing the the boss to use 10 HP to attack. With just 2 HP remaining, Est could have killed the boss if she doubled, which she didn't. Fortunately, a small change in plan of giving the Draco Shield to Est resulted in much better results, as Est had the perfect amount of speed that she didn't get doubled or double, causing the boss to be dropped to 7 HP, just low enough for Parla to secure the kill with a double. With the biggest threat successfully taken out, my flyers could run north to regroup. Then I steadily baited in the remaining enemies into the swamp tiles to slowly reduce their HP. Once in range to be killed, Selica or my flyers could swoop in to dispose of them, Really, there was no problem from here, it was pretty easy. After I recruited Conrad, I entered the dungeon Dolph's Keep, which later led into the Lost Treescape, where I encountered these Guardians, who when killed, actually gave a good amount of EXP. Since I wanted to promote Jesse for the huge boost he would gain as a Dreadfighter, I farmed some enemies for some extra EXP. While doing this, I explored around and picked up a few silver weapons. On my way out, there was a spring that gave defense, I gave one point of defense to all my flyers since they were easily my best units. Inside the adjacent village, I did a little forging for some more crit and less weight on Illwoon. I made a shadow sword and sent it over to Arm, and I upgraded a javelin for a little more hit. After shamelessly stealing two powerful stat boosters, Arm gained the ability to promote and I left the village and head west to this map. This map is noteworthy for featuring a mage with the powerful ability Upheaval that activates every couple turns to deal decent damage to your whole team. Fortunately, it can't kill anyone, but while weakened, your units are usually vulnerable to die. So to begin the map, I focused on killing the witches who could unpredictably teleport around and kill anyone who was hypothetically weakened. Jenny's soldiers helped me speed up this process, and with the witch's mediocre stats, mostly in HP and attack, along with their fairly weak magic with thunder, killing the witches honestly didn't take too long, and with them dead, the enemy counter could start working their magic, as they summoned in gargoyles. To keep the enemies in the forts contained, I blocked this choke point, and moved one team near the entrance, and another team was far away. This other team had a bad matchup against the incoming gargoyles, which is why I placed them so far away. Anyway, after looking at the enemies in the fort, it seemed very difficult to approach, as if anyone was damaged, the mages with Fortify would heal, erasing any progress I had made. This formation could only be defeated by carefully killing the units one by one, and to do that I had to gradually lure a mage around the fort. Since they used death, they dealt 5 HP to themselves every turn, and while I baited this mage, another mage used Fortify, dropping them to only 10 HP, so Katria attacked. 
and they fortunately wasn't healed since the boss used upheaval that turn. Then with a crit on the next turn, Katria managed to dispatch them. After continuing to bait in this mage, they reached here where 4 units were in range to attack, meaning of their 22 HP, 15 of it would always be consumed from just their counterattacks. and Celica with the Mage Ring finished them off. Without the help of the fortified mages, the boss was now able to be killed, so I attacked and attacked with Katria. Around 10 turns later, they were almost dead, and in range of Est, who killed them? And without the boss's fortify, I could finally kill the Kanta with Est and Katria, as long as Jenny kept them sustained with physics. Once they died, I just had to trap the remaining Dreadfighter and spam magic down on the Guardian to finish off another painfully slow map. Fortunately, next up was an easy one. It features some Guardians, Morgals, and Jeddah who summons more Morgals. What makes this easy is unlike turn 6, Jeddah just runs away and all the Morgals disappear with him, so you only have to fight 5 Guardians that do hit pretty hard, with some of them having over 30 attack, but their move is awful, so they're easy to outmaneuver. Allowing Celica and Paula to kill this one over here, Saber, Noma, Sonya, Leon, and eventually Catria to kill this one, the Guardian to the right held a Javelin, so it was best to let Celica slowly chip them down, and I decided to let Catria finish them off to give her a level. Then the final two over here could slowly be killed by Paula with the Draco Shield. Now with that map down, only Duma's tower remained before Celica would be finished with her route. After entering the tower with my 10 best units, I explored around, encountering some fights that I could easily retreat from, but after picking up a pretty useless Ladyblade, I found a Guardian, and the first required battle of this tower. Fortunately, it's pretty easy. There's one Dreadfighter to the left, another to the right, and six enemies near the center of the map, so I just moved Est up to Fight the large six unit squad with a Draco shield and a supply tile for healing, she wasn't dying. And the Dreadfighter over to the left was simple to deal with with Paula and Katria, while Saber did the same to the Dreadfighter to the right. With them now dead, I slowly baited the mages to move down. Unfortunately, this caused a Dreadfighter to move in who wasn't too strong, so it wasn't too much of a problem. And the mages weren't all that hard with ward arrows to silence them, making the rest of the encounter fairly unnoteworthy. On my way to the nearby Miller Shrine, I found another spring, one that boosted luck. I gave one point to Est and another to Paula. There was also one that gave speed. I gave one point to Est and another to Celica. After saving at the Miller statue, I ran back to the stairs to reach floor 2, where there was another spring, this time with skill. I gave one point to Katria and one point to Celica. Close by was our next required battle, and it was pretty easy. Again, just send a unit with the Draco Shield to fight the big squad of units, and the weak gargoyles to the left and right were easily solved with Paula for one side, and Est with the Draco Shield was in range of the gargoyles to the right. Once the terrorists died, I still had to kill the Bonite, who I just surrounded and quickly destroyed. On the next floor, there was a HP spraying, so after giving one point to Celica and another to Est, I found our next required fight. It was solved pretty much the same way as the last two. I sent Paula over to the right and Est up to fight almost everyone else. Since there were two Bonites near Paula, she needed some extra help that Celica could provide with Recover. There were now just two units moving in to attack the rest of my team, and they did succeed in killing Jenny, but with a use of Miller's turn will, I didn't bait in the Necro Dragon this time, and killing the lone Bonewalker was obviously easy. Again, this is another map where I just needed to be in a winning position, and then just click end turn like 30 times to kill everything. The Bonites were the only enemies that took some effort, but Celica killed the two to the left, and the final Bonite just got surrounded. On basically the final floor of Duma's Tower, there was an attack spring, a pretty useless one. I just gave the points to Jenny for more physic range. Guarding the very top of the tower was the final encounter. That at an initial glance seemed the hardest in the tower, as the map featured three Morgals, who could supposedly replicate randomly according to the game. But later on, I found out that as long as they can attack one of your units, they never seem to do this. So my plan of sending Katria to quickly kill the Morgal near the top middle of the map, S to fight the Morgal to the right, and Pala to fight the Morgul to the left was correct. After just one turn, I moved Silica in to replace Pala, as she had much better defense and speed. The other two flyers were not faring particularly well, but just good enough that as long as Jenny spammed physics, they would be okay. Which is why when a gargoyle made their way down with Eerie Screech to silence her, they were immediately a problem. Unlike this witch, who with her low HP died rather quickly. To prevent Jenny from being silenced, I just had to surround her, and with the occasional recover to keep Jesse healed, the gargoyle was no problem. 
problem anymore. Once Selica killed the Morgal to the left, she made her way over to the center of the map to help Katria, as she now didn't have to hold off the Guardians, and could retreat out of their attack range. Doing this also caused the enemy Morgal to move just outside of range of the Mages Fortify. With this task done, I just had to end turn and wait for the enemies to die, with the most important to kill being the Mage, who died thanks to a lucky crit from Selica. When only two enemies remained, I surrounded them to speed up the killing process, with every enemy killed we reached the top of the tower and finished Selica's route. So now it was arms time to shine. But first, I ran back to the forest village to forge an ill wound for the lunge combat art from a shadow sword that I sent over from Selica. Our next encounter was another fight against Burkut. I started the map with a pretty simple plan in mind of sending arm towards the right, Cliff with a coral ring to fight the mages, and Clive with a steel shield to the left. And I expected that they'd all be mostly fine and kill everyone slowly. But that didn't go as planned, as arm was getting destroyed. Clive could be doing better, and Cliff was almost dead. So Clive and Arm just retreated south, since they could outrun the armors. But Cliff was stuck on the supply tile, and since I had two other physic targets, I needed to solve his problem fast. To do this, I just lured the mages down in range for me to swiftly kill. And since when they moved down, they were out of range of being healed, this strategy was mostly effective. And with two powerful Maya Mages taken down, Cliff wasn't exactly safe, but he wasn't taking like over 50% of his HP in a single turn now. So the occasional physic was enough to keep him sustained now. And the problem now was just keeping the enemies away from my big squad of mediocre units near the bottom of the map. That at first was pretty easy, but when the armored units that attacked Arm and Clive got low, they ran over to a mage to heal. And for this one, he followed the mage I baited down. And now my lower team had to juggle fighting off the remaining mage, as well as fighting off the quite strong knight, which wasn't too hard, as when the mage died, the knight just ran away to another healer, but I chased them down and killed them to deny this opportunity. Afterwards, I managed to kill the second to last mage, and since the final mage couldn't be healed, Cliff eventually finished them off. By now, the map was pretty much over. I just surrounded a few of the enemy survivors and fed the XP to Delphia, as I valued her exceptionally high res, and I wanted her to gain as much speed as possible. The final enemy survivor was Bakut, who with his crawl rings healing, was just attacking arm and healing back the HP. So I needed more units to attack him, and then he was easy to take down, so I moved on to Raquel Forest. For this map, I warped up Cliff in an attempt to block the supply tile at the top left side of the map, but I had some problems with the witches. That immediately allowed me to acknowledge I had some liabilities on my team, specifically Lucas and Forsyth, whose terrible speed was becoming a huge problem, as they were getting doubled and dying. I had some problems with Lufir too, along with Bray, so for now, I reset the map and chose to not deploy them. On attempt 2, I warped Cliff again, but this time over towards the top right, to try to help damage the witches that didn't really help that much, as they all walked south by like turn 5. The first two that came in were welcome, as they were simple to position around, and I scored a KO. Unfortunately, on the next turn, all but one witch walked down, and all of their ranges overlapped. I could really just frontline with all my units with good res, and they immediately found a weak point in this formation and attacked it until it crumbled. But after a use of the turn wheel to attempt to fix my mistake, I found that I didn't learn as I made the same mistake again. But this time, I just got lucky, and they survived. Once I killed the mage right here, the same problem would never happen again. The enemies just didn't have the firepower to kill anyone, so they just gradually died one by one. And with them gone, only a few Myrmidons and Dreadfighters remain, who Cliff was currently fighting. But right now, I wasn't blocking all the supply tiles, so to stop their healing, I walked Clive over to block one, and Matilda for the other one. But she wasn't strong enough, so Cliff eventually blocked that one, and I eventually fed the final few kills to Matilda, as I wanted to get her promoted. Now, I could immediately head left to not attempt like the hardest arm map for this run with Nui Baba's abode, or I could head right and not be a coward. The choice was obvious meaning the next map would be a fight against Marla, who could conjure other witches. So I wanted her gone, and I wanted her gone quickly. But since the path directly to her was blocked, warping in was my only option. And Silk didn't have the warp range to do this on turn 1. And on turn 2, Marla conjured witches to block the tiles next to her. So I had to wait another turn before I could warp in. While Cliff and Silk waited, I needed a plan for the enemies to the east. 
Fortunately, with a steel shield and a defensive combat art, Clive could keep most foes to the east at bay. After Cliff walked next to Marla, she would never conjure again, as long as Cliff stayed in her attack range. There was a slight problem with this, however, as in order to warp him up, Silk had to be placed in danger. She needed some healing to retreat, and Tobin and Faye could provide this. And this allowed her to summon Dreadfighters to slow the enemy's advance, allowing her to safely regroup. Now, I pretty much just continuously summoned more Dreadfighters that were doing a pretty good job, and the enemies weren't too strong. I was in a pretty comfortable position. Now, I just steadily started to surround the approaching foes and dispatch them, aiming for greater kill them since he would become significantly more useful if he promoted. The only change in pace from here were the snipers near Clive, who were solved with the usual lure them in, surround them, and kill them. Pretty simple. Nui Baba's abode was up next, but I needed to power up my units a little, so I ran over to the Fear Mountain Shrine. Inside the shrine, there was this trial against this white dragon, where I literally just warped in Cliff, and he alone could, like, take everyone. But I wanted to distribute some EXP to Grey, so I warped him in, got a kill, and rescued him away, and I fed him a few more kills in the easy encounter, allowing me to promote him and Matilda at the nearby Miller statue. After giving Arm and Cliff a little more speed, I ventured deeper into the shrine, taking the right path because I honestly didn't remember which way went where. And it led to this room that doesn't really have much in it other than some terrors and breakable crates that have a chance to drop a very good sword, but it has like a 3% chance of appearing, and I wasn't lucky this time around. In the next room, there was a speed ring and another unretreatable encounter, this time against a canter who guarded an incredibly useful Hexlock shield, granting 7 whole res and reducing magic damage received by half, immensely useful against Nui Baba. So so how difficult was the fight itself? Uh pretty unremarkable really. I just warped in Cliff to kill the mage who could heal, and then most enemies began to die. My southern team got a kill every now and then, but they were mostly just fighting the summoned gargoyles. Once Cliff finished up, I could trade him over a silver bow to continuously silence the canter, stopping them from summoning more gargoyles, so Silk's expels were putting in work at removing the few gargoyles that remained. With the gargoyles numbers reduced, everyone moved near the canter and attacked it until it died, rewarding us with a hexog shield and a little deeper in, I picked up a silver shield. From there, I returned to the room with the choice to head left or right, and I explored the left path. That contained basically nothing, there's like a few enemies that I'm not going to fight, a revival spring that I'm oh, never no. going to use, a shadow sword that I have no use of, and a cog, the only useful item down the left path. With the dungeon fully explored, I promoted Delphia and I left the dungeon. I then encountered this encounter that I'm going to pretend didn't happen since it wasn't interesting or difficult. Unlike Nui Baba's abode, a map filled with mages with fortify, supply tiles for even more healing, and the most aggravating of them all, a canter. Needless to say, it was going to be a long, painful battle. What initially also seemed to be bad is there was another 10 units present, since Nui Baba summoned them in the overworld. However, I came up with a plan that actually made this good, as the three mages over here would heal each other and deal no damage to Delphia. So these three mages were contributing nothing and preventing three extra guards gargoyles from being summoned, as if you remember from before, there's a limit of 20 enemies per chapter. I could also block this choke point above, preventing even more gargoyles from being summoned. Even the witches could just be weakened to 1 HP to be useless, meaning the canter wasn't as annoying as they initially seemed. With a warp descending cliff who needed to hold the hexlock shield, I began to take out the mages, that at first I had to lure them near the top right of the map so they would not be in range to be healed with fortify. Unfortunately, when they were low, they would retreat, and and I found out the hard way that Cliff alone wouldn't be enough to kill them. I needed someone to help chase them down and block them from moving. My best choice for this was Claire, thanks to her great mobility. To safely bait the mages in, I needed Cliff to hold the Hexlock shield, as Nui Baba's Medusa would reduce Cliff's HP to 1 without it, but with it he took half damage from that attack, keeping him healthy enough to take a few more attacks. The more mages I killed, the more gargoyles ran south, but Clive could at least hold them off for now at least. To take on Nui Baba herself, I needed to make sure all other mages were dead, something that I had already done. Then I just needed to move Cliff in her attack range, and after about 20 turns, she died. So now I could kill the canter, but now Claire was surrounded, and Cliff alone couldn't get the job done, so I had to slowly warp and rescue in most of my units, 
and after a few key members were in place, I could silence the Kanto with an inconsistent ward arrow that became significantly more consistent after I used lunge to move them off the supply tile. Then I could surround them to prevent them from moving onto another supply tile, so they were pretty easy to kill now. And the rest of the map was just more of the same. Just surround the enemies, attack them for like 4 turns, and kill them. With Nui Baba's abode conquered, I could recruit Tatiana, and make my way over to Zeke, who with Tatiana saved became a green unit to help in this map. Also, Zeke's allied units all have 99 defense, and that makes this map pretty easy. And they did most of the work. I just had to use rescue to keep Zeke safe and out of enemy range, since he had his normal defense and could actually die. By blocking this choke point over here, this map was a glorified cutscene, as I just waited in anticipation for the green units to finish off everyone. All they needed was an occasional physic, and the map was as good as done. With that battle done, I entered the nearby village to recruit Zeke, and forged some weapons. Once I was finished, I journeyed deeper into Regal, and began our next battle. It looked to be quite difficult. Lots of mages, Hestia, a Kanta who could conjure, so with these difficult problems, it really got me thinking at how I would solve it. I just walked in Cliff, and he gradually killed Hestia, and since a nearby Bonite blocked the supply tile, the enemies couldn't really heal with it, making Cliff's job easy. And speaking of easy, Armour easily held this choke point in the bottom right side of the map, while I had Claire block the units above in this choke point to prevent them from retreating, so my ranged units could slowly kill them. And from there, I moved arm away to block this choke. With ward arrows to constantly silence, I slowly defeated this mage here. And with all the mages gone, I could actually kill the canter. So I moved in arm to use lunge, and I trapped the canter, meaning with enough attacks, they would slowly die. And with them gone, most enemies were either alone and simple to kill, or just had low HP, and took next to no effort to kill. After routing the map, I head east over to the secret shrine. A really short dungeon that had a defense spring, a gold mark, and a nectar. Nothing too important, and after leaving, I advanced to our final battle against Slade. For this map, I immediately noticed the mages with Fortify. I needed them gone, so I lured one down, carefully making sure to not drop them below 50% so they wouldn't trigger heal AI when I wasn't prepared. When I dropped them below 50%, everyone attacked them at once, dealing enough damage to kill, so I didn't have to worry about them retreating. I now pretty much just repeated this plan to kill all five mages, and then I could kill the Bonites. To kill them swiftly and efficiently, I lured the two of them to the bottom of the room, then I warped in someone with one to two range, and the Bonites slowly died on enemy phase. At first, I did this covering three choke points with Fae to the right, Arm in the center, and Cliff to the left. When they were gone, I could Warp and rescue around to place Cliff and Arm to fight the Bow Knights in the final two lanes. With more warps and rescues to move in more allies, I found it easy to trap the remaining enemies like Slade and the Barons, so they couldn't retreat to a heal tile, making it possible to finish them all off. Act 4 was now almost over, only one final battle remains the fight against Rudolph, and he was a formidable opponent with his high crit, attack, and speed, and a warped in Matilda was no match for him. Fortunately, I had a stronger unit with Claire, who just barely survived Rudolph's army's assault. I had to rescue him out, and then I baited in Rudolph's army south to this choke point here, where I noticed that the gold knights could stand on the water, meaning if I could position like this, I could lure Rudolph past the enemies out of range of healing. This is the part where Rudolph's formidable stats were a problem, and with bow knights in range to attack, everyone needed high defense to survive, and since I traded Clive's shield over to Grey, he died along with Delphia. With the use of the turn wheel, I fixed my mistake and executed my plan better, as now I only had to block three spaces to prevent the enemies from above from moving in, and with arms constant lunges, I could move just out of range of the bow knights, and the only unit at risk of dying now was Claire but only if she was crit, which actually did happen. Fortunately, she didn't actually have to stand next to Rudolph, as Silk could summon Dreadfighters to block the two spaces next to him, because the two other tiles next to her were blocked. An arm who couldn't be attacked, and Clive who had solid defense could block the other two spaces. In the winning position, I just rained down attack after attack on Rudolph until he slowly met his end. Ending Act 4, but before I entered the Duma Temple, there were a few items I had to pick up, and I also had to do some forging. The first item I needed to pick up was a random drop from a crate in this specific area in the Fear Mountain Shrine, 
it has about a 3% chance to drop, and once you break enough crates, they stop dropping items, so you have to retreat and re-enter the dungeon to make more items appear. It took me about an hour to find this item. It was a rusted sword, nothing special right now, but it could be forged into a venom sword that inflicts poison on contact. And how much damage does poison do in this game? 10 whole points of consistent damage, the most damage we could possibly deal in this run. A weapon that I anticipated would be extremely useful in Act 5, and after a detour down to the Thieves Shrine for a literal orange to craft an Ambrosia with this NPC, I was ready to step foot in Duma's Temple and end this game. After what was essentially a straightforward hallway, I picked up a Brave Sword and was given the choice to head left, the wrong direction, or right, the right direction. So I went right and immediately encountered Bakud for a tough battle. There were mages that could heal, a Morgal that could replicate, and Renea who had both the pack skill giving her magic no downside, and Concha to summon witches. A difficult map, I decided to at first warp Tatiana who had high res to the top left side of the map to keep the mages busy, then I moved up to fight the Morgal. I then ended turn and realized that this map was going to be far harder than expected. You see, all enemies just recover 10 whole points of HP a turn, practically making it impossible to harm them, without the Venom Sword, a weapon that would deal 10 damage on every turn. Unfortunately, Renea conjured some witches and Tatiana wasn't doing good since she could be crit. So with the turn wheel, I tried the map again. This time, I made sure to send in Cliff to be next to Renea on turn one, to prevent her from having a chance to conjure any witches. Arn pretty much did the same as last time, and he made sure to keep his distance a little to have the space to move out of range of Renea's fortify. While near the top left, I warped in Grey and realized that this was a bad decision. So I rescued him back and brought in Delphia who had both great luck to avoid crits and high res to survive the attacks. And since Tatiana had better res than her, the mages wouldn't attack her, allowing me to safely warp her adjacent to her so they could heal each other. Now I was pretty much in a position where I just had to wait for the enemy's attacking arm to have the minimum amount of HP. Cliff was our only unit at risk of dying, but he could be healed with physic by two units. Once arm dropped the enemies to around 11 HP, the minimum possible for him alone since they recovered their HP after the poison damage. I lured them one by one near my main team, who all at once dealt more more than 11 damage and killed them. With the first four enemies gone, I lured in the mages and attempted to kill them, finding them way easier to kill than the last four enemies since they damaged themselves with magic. Next up, I had to defeat the dreads. Again, I just attacked them with arm, got them down to around 11 HP and killed them. Pretty simple, leaving just Renea and Burkut. Renea was the more problematic one with her high magic damage, so I pretty much used Lange to lure her away from Burkut, both preventing him from attacking anyone who attacked Renea and removing their support bonuses which grants Renea a huge avoid boost. Without the avoid boost, I could land consistent ward arrows to render her useless, and with everyone together we could outpace her 15 HP recovered every turn and kill her. Burkut was much easier to deal with, I just let him attack Arm until he had around 11 HP, then everyone came in to finish him off. After Claire landed the killing blow, I could fortunately save my game and receive the keepsake ring, a slight upgrade over a coral ring. I now could explore the depths of Duma's temple to reach the big door, but first I took this path in the teleportation room, taking me to a room with Gradivus, a weapon that I'm never going to use. After taking the only nearby teleporter, I was teleported to the room to the left of where we had the choice to go left or right from before. There aren't really any useful items here, there's only a spring that gives EXP that I decided to save for later. Once I escaped that room, it really was just a clear path to the end, but I still decided to take a detour to pick up a gold mark that I literally cannot use. After finally reaching the big door, I ran to the right to begin arms free battles that he had to do solo that are all extremely easy, and it was merely a test of if my hands would get tired from cooking end turn like a hundred times. Our reward for reaching the end was the Sword of Ocean, granting recovery and the ability to damage Duma when he was below 52 HP. Celica was also there and she helped open the way to the final battle, but first I made extra sure that I couldn't leave by running all the way back to the start. After wasting like 5 minutes of my life, I ran back to the EXP statue to give Matilda 2 levels, and entered the big door to begin the final battle. The map had the same big problems we had faced before, 
enemies with conjure, a mage who could heal, and an army of Morgals who could replicate. But what was good is that the enemy army consisted of 20 units, so for now they would never use conjure. And since this was a defeat boss map, I knew I had to prioritize Duma. So I warped clip in range, and now Duma would start to move along with the two bow knights. Arm's team didn't really do that much, other than Arm himself, who fought off the three initially aggressive enemies. Silica's team was surrounded by Morgals, who I expected I would have to kill, and my flyers initially engaged them, but after a few turns, I noticed that most of them just stayed completely still, and sure enough, if I moved outside of range of the ones that I aggroed, they too would just stand completely still and do literally nothing, meaning the two Bow Knights and Duma who was firing off upheavals were my only problem. The upheavals were easily solved with a simple fortify with Tatiana. As for the Bow Knights, I baited them across the Poisonous Swamp, but to do that safely, I needed the Morgals to move a little, which I could do with a little assistance from Faye, Claire, Clive, and Matilda. When they were low, they could easily be finished off, and Duma was pretty close by, so I now took the time to rescue over or warp all of Selica's team, except Bowie. I mean, he's probably not going to be useful, right? Anyway, once Silk was rescued over, I warped Carla near Jeddah, with her goal being to hold off any reinforcements. And speaking of reinforcements, a witch ended up warping in, and instead of killing them, I just intentionally dropped them to 1 HP, so they couldn't attack. Duma was now closing in, and the second he left the poisonous swamp, Selica armed Cliff and Faye swiftly surrounded him. All very durable units, especially considering Faye had the Draco shield for the high defense boost, and Tilika had the Hexlock shield to half magic damage. Now they pretty much attacked and attacked, and with the steady stream of heals from Tatiana, they all had no chance to die, meaning it was smooth sailing until Duma reached 52 HP causing him to equip Oculus, making him immune to oh, all no. attacks that aren't either Nosferatu or Ocean. So once that happened, I moved in Silk and equipped her with the Hexlock Shield, as Arm and Faye wouldn't cut it. I needed to deal more damage to outpace Duma's health restoration. All appeared to be good. He was taking a little damage every turn. It was only a matter of time before he just randomly healed like 40 HP, making this challenge impossible. After literally analyzing the footage, I realized that if Duma had less than 20 HP, instead of healing 5 HP a turn, he heals 40 HP a turn, so I just had to deal around 20 damage in a single turn. But the units that could deal damage were limited from Oculus. Only Arm, Faye, Silk, Jenny, and Tatiana could deal damage. Since they all doubled, all together they dealt 10 damage, and had a small chance to crit for a maximum damage of 30. So this was possible, I just needed good luck. One of my first struggles was making sure Duma had as low HP as possible before I engaged him. As if he had 20 HP on enemy phase, he could attack Arm and Arm could double crit to save me one damage. But unfortunately the first time this happened, I didn't have the luck I needed to kill Duma once and for all. I also found my hit rates were low, so I needed to use some supports to improve them. And for some reason, Jesse supports Silk for plus 10 hit, and remember Bowie, he gives Jenny 5 extra hits. The problem that came from landing the final blow is it was risky. Every failed attempt had to be saved with the turn wheel, and I was almost out of uses. But this time, I dropped him to 20 HP, and got a lucky double crit on enemy phase. So I just had to deal 19 damage, and with a double crit with arm, it looked more and more possible I would win. I danced arm to attack again, and he crit again, and again for another double crit. With 7 HP remaining, just one of my six remaining attacks had to crit to result in victory. To maximize my odds, my saints equipped angel rings for more crits. Tatiana attacked, but no crits. Then Jenny attacked, no crits again. Then Silk attacked, I saw the dialogue, and I knew this challenge was over. As Silk crit, killing Duma, baiting the screen to black so Arm could quickly stab Duma off screen. Now for my thoughts on this challenge. I generally thought it was pretty fun and interesting for the first two acts. Back then, most maps required me to play carefully, and really strategize to overcome the problems I was facing. But unfortunately from around Act 3 onwards, my strategies became mostly uninteresting. I usually just sent in a really strong unit who had good defense to kill everyone, and I sustained them with physics. Around Act 4, I did a little experimentation with weapons, equipment, and combat arts, but my strategies mostly stayed the same. It was still satisfying to beat, especially considering the scare at the end with Duma recovering 40 HP. Anyway, if you did enjoy, reminder that likes and subscribes are highly appreciated, as well as your thoughts on the run in the comments. See ya!